Thank you, Mr. Darwin, for being with us. We are in front of an audience of very interested people in science and what the future will bring. So I will start asking you some control question of a more personal nature. Are you okay with that? Yes, that is fine with me. I'm always happy to speak about my life and work with those who are interested in science and its future. Thank you very much. Well, are you married? Um, do you have children? I was married to my wife, Emma Wedgworth, in 1839. She is a wonderful companion and has been very supportive of my work. We had ten children together, three of whom died in infancy. We have seven surviving children, who I am very proud of. Where have you lived? I was born in Shrewsbury, England, and lived there for most of my childhood. I attended the University of Edinburgh and the University of Cambridge, where I studied natural science. After completing my studies, I spent several years traveling on board HMS Beagle as a naturalist. I currently live in Down, England. Thank you, Mr. Darwin. Now we are ready to start. What role do you believe uh, doubt and certainty has in scientific discoveries? In science, doubt and uncertainty are essential elements. As scientists, we must always be open to new evidence and willing to question our previous beliefs. This willingness to doubt allows us to continue to learn and discover new things about the world around us. At the same time, certainty can also play a role in science. When we have gathered sufficient evidence to support a hypothesis, we can be confident in our conclusions and use them to make predictions about the natural world. However, we must always be open to the possibility that new evidence may emerge that challenges our current understanding. That's interesting. And what role does science, philosophy and religion have in your work? Science, philosophy and religion have all played a role in my work. Science has been the foundation of my research into natural selection and evolution. It is through science that I was able to observe nature closely enough to make discoveries about how species change over time. Philosophy helped me think more deeply about what these observations meant for our understanding of life on Earth. While religion provided an ethical framework within which I could consider the implications of this new knowledge. Now, um Let's talk about the theory of evolution. What did you feel when you finally get to your theory of evolution in its final form? Was that a kind of a eureka moment? When my theory of evolution by natural selection reached its final form, I felt a sense of excitement and accomplishment. It was the culmination of many years of observation, experimentation and contemplation and I knew that it had the potential to change the way we think about the natural world. It was not a sudden eureka moment, but rather the result of a long and careful process of scientific inquiry. I was eager to share my ideas with others and see how they would be received by the scientific community. I understand you like food. There was in our time a very famous chef called Anthony Bourdain. He traveled the world trying the most extravagant food from the places he visited. I understand that you are a kind of Anthony Bourdain of your time. Am I right? Uh, it is, is it true that you are passionate for food and flavors? <laughs> I'm not familiar with the person you're referring to, but I do enjoy trying new foods and flavors from the places I have visited. During my travels on board HMS Beagle, I had the opportunity to taste many exotic fruits, including tortoises, iguanas, and armadillos. I found these new flavors to be interesting and enjoyable, and I often wrote about them in my diary. I also enjoy cooking and experimenting with different ingredients and recipes. However, I do not consider myself to be a culinary celebrity like the person you mentioned. In your book, Travel, a Naturalist Voyage Around the World, Observations of Concepcion Earthquake, 1835, book you say, and I quote, an earthquake instantly reverses the strongest ideas. Well, you know that Chile is probably 
the capital of earthquakes in the world. So can you expand on what you had in mind when you wrote this? When I wrote this, I was reflecting on the powerful and sudden nature of earthquakes. As a naturalist, I was accustomed to observing and studying the slow, gradual changes that occur in the natural world. However, an earthquake is a sudden and violent event that can drastically alter the landscape and cause widespread destruction. This sudden and unexpected change can challenge our preconceived notions and ideas about the natural world, and it can make us question the stability and certainty of our surroundings. In this sense, an earthquake can reverse our strongest ideas and beliefs about the natural world. I'm sorry to get a little bit technical, but what defines a new species? Is it created or is it discovered? A new species is a group of organisms that is distinct from other groups and can breed amongst themselves to produce fertile offsprings. The process by which new species are created can happen in several ways. For example, a new species can arise through the splitting of a single population into two or more isolated groups that are unable to interbreed with each other. This can happen due to geographical barriers, such as a mountain range or a river, or due to differences in behavior or sexual preferences. In this sense, new species are both created and discovered as they arise through natural processes and are then identified and named by scientists. Charles, are we the strongest species on Earth? What do you think, for example, about plants in relation to humans? It is difficult to say whether humans are the strongest species. A strength can be measured in many different ways. In terms of physical strength, there are many other animals that are stronger than humans. For example, as gorillas and elephants, they are much stronger than humans in terms of physical, raw power. In terms of intelligence, humans are considered to be one of the most intelligent species on Earth, with complex brains and the ability to develop and use advanced tools and technologies. In terms of plants, men and other animals are dependent on plants for food, air and other resources. While plants may not have the same physical or intellectual powers as men or animals, they are of vital importance and should not be underestimated. Is there such a thing like reverse evolution or involution? You could be describing a process by which an organism loses characteristics or abilities that it once had. For example, some species of cave-dwelling fish have lost their eyes over time, as they no longer need them in their dark, underground environment. However, it is important to know that evolution is a process that occurs over long periods of time and is driven by natural selection. It favors traits that are advantageous for survival and reproduction, while some traits may be lost. This does not necessarily mean that the organism is evolving in reverse. Instead, the organism is simply adapting to its current environment. Yes, Mr. Darwin, well, we, as human beings, we have the tendency to migrate. Maybe you don't know, but now we are looking not for a new continent, but for a new planet. It seems that our next migration will be into space. We want to conquer space, but we don't have adequate bodies to do that. Do you believe, do you believe that we can evolve to conquer other worlds? I believe that humans are a remarkably adaptable species, and we have shown remarkable ingenuity in tackling problems throughout history. I believe it is likely that as our knowledge increases through further scientific exploration of space, technology will eventually provide us with feasible solutions for inhabiting other planets beyond Earth. This does depend on many unknown variables though, such as what form life may take elsewhere in the universe. Making predictions about how evolution could interact with these is near to impossible right now. However, I am hopeful that science can continue advancing during my lifetime or those of future generations. The um, universe exploration is nowadays our frontier for humans, but still the big, big human frontier is the same that it was in your time and is death. Did death have an impact in your work? Death has had a profound impact on my work. 
I was particularly interested in the concept of extinction and how species can become extinct over time due to environmental change or other factors. This led me to develop theories about natural selection and evolution, which have since become widely accepted by scientists around the world. Death has also played an important role in shaping our understanding of life as we know it today, with its ability to bring change for adaption and survival of certain traits within populations that are better suited for their environment than others. The idea of death and extinction makes me think about the big problem that we have, and it's called climate change. Uh, me, maybe you don't know this concept, but do you recall, for example, the chimneys that produce this thick black smoke in the cities of your native England? Yes, they were awful. The air was so bad in London in the 1840s that there was a popular belief that the smoke would cause the city to become uninhabitable. That's actually one of the reasons that Charles Dickens included so much criticism of industrialization in many of his novels. There was a real sense that the city had become completely overwhelmed with factories. Well, as it turns out, the smoke and other air pollution we continue to generate is producing nowadays climate change at a global level. I don't find that surprising. People really didn't fully understand the potential repercussions of the rapid industrialization that was taking place. Well, global temperatures are one degree Celsius higher than in 1880, and by 2100, they could rise by as much as four degrees if nothing were to be done. That's an incredibly huge transformation. Just one degree change could have massive impacts. A four degree increase in world temperature would utterly transform the planet. We're talking about the extinction of thousands of species, enormous population displacements due to drought and famine, and widespread economic uncertainty. It really is an existential threat to human civilization. Sure, but from your experience, what would it lead to the extinction of thousands of species? A rise of four degrees would completely alter natural conditions. Many species will naturally be unable to cope with such a massive rise in temperatures, causing them to die out. There is also the possibility of cascading effects. One species of insect might not be able to survive, and if they are a food source, then the birds that eat them might die out too. This will cause an enormous disruption, which could lead to the extinction of many other species. Plants and animals are bound together by a web of complex relations. The problem of climate change is devastating, so let's go into change the subject and let's talk about what we need or why do we need to protect something special. For example, what's the role of beauty in evolution? Beauty is an important factor in evolution. It can be used to attract partners and increase the chances of successful reproduction. In many species, males will display colorful plumage or other features that are attractive to females. This helps them stand out from their competitors and increases their chances of finding a partner. Beauty also plays a role in sexual selection. If two individuals have similar traits, but one has more beautiful characteristics than the other, then they may be chosen over the less attractive individual due to their beauty alone. As human beings, we share with other species the need to categorize uh, ourselves to understand who is weaker and who is stronger. But we take, the humans, we take this to the next level. That is, whoever has something perceived as of great value, such as the biggest diamond in the world, generates an attribute of strength that places the others at a lower level. Our capacity for abstraction is what has made us dominant, but it can also make us lose our way. In a world dominated by a non-biological variables such as money, success, popularity, does evolution favor these variables even though they are not biologically enduring? I believe that evolution does not favor these non-biological variables as they are not biologically enduring. These variables can provide an advantage in the short term, but they do not provide an evolutionary advantage in the long term. 
Evolution favors traits that are beneficial to the species in the long term, such as the ability to adapt to changing environments, find food, and reproduce successfully. Humans organize under different governing models, such as democracy, totalitarianism, monarchy. Does natural world have hierarchies? What can we learn from that? The natural world does have hierarchies. Animals can form hierarchies based on dominance and power within a group, and these hierarchies can help them to survive. We can learn from these hierarchies that power and dominance can be beneficial in certain contexts. But it is also important to remember that cooperation and collaboration are essential for a successful society. It looks like education is not enough to alter or transform a person. Uh, what do you think? Do you believe that education has the power to alter people's evolution? Yes. I believe that education has the power to alter the course of evolution. Education can help individuals acquire knowledge and skills, which may be beneficial for the survival until reproductive age. For example, learning how to hunt or build shelters could increase an individual's chances of surviving long enough to reproduce and pass on these traits through inheritance. In this way, educational experiences have the potential to shape evolutionary processes over time by influencing what characteristics are passed down from generation to generation in a species population. Speaking about evolution, what do you think about humans finding a way to alter our biology by means of artifacts or scientific discoveries? Uh, what is your opinion in us trying to alter the evolutionary process that you discover? In other words, how do you feel about us playing God? I believe that humans have the potential to alter their biology through scientific and technological advances. But I also believe that it is important to approach this with caution. We should always seek to understand the consequences of our actions and ensure that we are not harming any other form of life or disrupting the natural balance of the environment. We should also be mindful of the ethical implications of altering our biology and consider the impacts it may have on future generations. Ultimately, I believe that it is important to approach this with respect and humility and to remember that we are still part of the natural world. Sometimes evolutionary changes occur at the same time in different places of the world. In fact, um, thinkers, for example, in different places sometimes they get to the same idea uh, maybe you have experienced that. Do you believe that there is a sort of invisible net of relations that connect humans like those of fungi or a kind of pollen? I do believe that there is an invisible web of relations that connects humans, just like there are connections between fungi and species of pollen. I believe that this connection is based on the fact that we all share a common ancestor in that information and ideas can be shared and passed down through generations. This connection can be seen in the similarities between cultures and technologies that exist in different parts of the world, as well as in the way that similar ideas can emerge in different places at the same time. Thank you very much, Mr. Darwin, for this conversation. It's been a real pleasure and a surprise to have you here talking with us. I hope to see you in the future. Well, especially me who really is going to die, not you. Thank you very much for your kind words. It is a great honor to be here and I'm delighted that so many people are interested in my work. I have been fortunate enough to have spent the last few decades of my life studying nature. My hope is that future generations will continue exploring these topics with even greater insight than we can today.